So our topic today is developing a thankful heart. I'll say it again, developing a thankful heart. In my studies, I came across this passage and it really challenged me. It says one of the first marks of rejecting God is forgetting to thank him. I'll say it again. One of the first marks of rejecting God is forgetting to thank him. The scripture reference was, was from Romans chapter 1, verse 21. And for the projection ministry, we'll be going to a lot of the scriptures. I hope y'all can hang with me. If not, everybody jot them down or, you know, do whatever you can. If not, if you need me to send them to you later, just get with me after service because there's a lot of scripture because I can stand here and give you my opinion all day long. But I believe the thing that stands, and I know it is, the thing that stands forever is the word of God. He watches over that to perform it so I can give you my opinion, but I want you to really get what his word is saying about these things because you know that that's going to last. So Romans 121, this particular version I'm reading is from the Living Bible. It says, yes, they knew about him all right, but they wouldn't admit it or worship him or even thank him for all his daily care. And after a while, they began to think up silly ideas of what God was like and what he wanted them to do. The result was their foolish minds became dark and confused. So the part that jumped out at me is that we know about God. A lot of times we don't admit it. We got any undercover Christians? I know you're undercover because you won't even say nothing. Then they wouldn't worship him. And then it says they even forgot to thank him for all of his daily care. So after a while, they began to think up these silly ideas of what God should be like. That kind of sounds like what's going on now, right? Because where we used to say that God was the creator of the universe, now you hear people saying, well, you know, I don't want to put that out there in the universe because you know the universe will give it back to you. So when did the universe become in charge? You know, and then we'll start talking, you know, we'll, get, we'll adopt all these new age philosophies because we got these silly ideas because, remember, we wasn't worshiping God and we wasn't thanking him for his daily care. So now we got these silly ideas about what we think God is like. And so instead of going to the word of God that talks about the law of reaping and sowing, we want to talk about karma. And so we dream up all these silly ideas about what God is like and what we wanted him to do. And the result is that our foolish minds become dark and confused. Now, first of all, I don't know about you, but I don't even want a foolish mind. <laughs> and not only did you have a foolish mind by not thinking him, thanking him, you have a foolish mind that's both dark and confused. You're jacked up all around. I'm jacked up all around, no matter what way I look at it, because this thing right here, I forgot to thank God, and therefore I started rejecting God. We'll look at some scriptures. Let's turn to Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Very familiar story. I'm going to read this one out of the King James. It says, and it came to pass, if y'all can put that up so everybody could follow, Luke chapter, um, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 of Luke. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. 
Now we hear this story and a lot of times we think about, okay, 10 lepers, we know that they're living kind of separated from everybody because they have this infectious uh, skin condition and they can't live in the camp. They didn't choose to not live in the camp, so they didn't choose to move to the suburbs. They got kicked out of the city, so they had to live on the outskirts of town, you know, past the trailer park, across the railroad tracks down there by the creek that don't nobody want to go to. They out there. And we think about them, and then we hear about the one that turned around and say thanks. Just one. One out of ten. That's a tithe. Somebody get that later. One out of ten came back. So a lot of times when we preach on this, we preach about that one. Because in our Christian mindset, we think that we are like that one. But we're going to get a news flash in just a minute. So today we're going to ask some questions like, what was going on with the other nine people? Have y'all ever read the Bible and questioned that? What's going on with these other nine folks? Now, God has clearly healed you. You don't have to be separated from everybody else. So you couldn't even turn around and tell them thank you? Well, maybe they were too busy to give thanks. They were too busy trying to get those uh, sick people clothes off and trying to go wash and trying to get it together so they can go and rejoin their family. Maybe they were too excited about rejoining their loved ones. You know, they've been out of the camp. It didn't say how long, but leprosy was not something that you just got over. So it could have been five months, it could have been five years, it could have been 15 years that they haven't had close interpersonal relationship with anybody. And if you haven't been close to somebody in that long, you know, you get a chance to get close to them. What you doing, Ray? You know, when you get off work, you're running home to see BJ because you want to be close to her. So maybe you're just excited. Maybe they were excited. They're like, yeah, I get to go back and see my loved ones. I get to go back and hang out, get to go back and shoot ball, you know, whatever. Maybe they were just ready to get on with life. They had been in that condition so long, in that situation so long, and now I'm free. I can just go and do what I want to do. I can go and live my best life. That's right. They ain't going back and forth with you. (laughs) So you know I knew that one. (laughs) Or perhaps they were grateful in their hearts, and they figured that God should just know. Now let's look at our lives, because we're talking about these nine people. Now, let's, now we're going to see where we are in this. Let's look at our lives in 21st century America. Y'all remember 9-11? Everybody remember a horrible day in American history? One of the things that we did at that time, what did we do? We rallied together. We prayed. There were prayer vigils and prayer meetings all over the place, and people were praying and digging through rubble trying to find their loved ones, even if it was just to recover a body. We did all that, but we prayed and we looked to God. Then turn around a few years later, we get this bombing at the Boston Marathon. We're not looking to God. No, what? We're Boston strong. We started to reject God because we forgot to give him thanks for what he'd done. We were so concerned about what the tragedy that happened, we didn't stop to thank him for the lives that were spared. So maybe in our lives today, we're more like the nine than we are the one. Sometimes maybe we're busy. I don't know about y'all, but I live an extremely busy life. Y'all want to go there with me? Can I take y'all through, those of y'all that were 8 o'clock, I took y'all through a day in the life of Alpha and Hunter James. So for your 1130 crowd, I don't want y'all to feel left out. So here we go. We hit the floor about 6.30 a.m. We're out the door between 7 and 7.15 we drive from Lithonia to Avondale Estates to the Cab School of the Arts. Hunter gets out, he's at school. If it's not a Monday or a Wednesday, then I have to get back in the car and drive from Avondale Estates to Douglasville so that I can go to work and do from 8 to 4.45, which, you know, since he didn't get to school till 7.30, it's more like 8.15 to 5 o'clock, and sometimes it's 8.30 to 5.15, but that's neither here nor there. So I get off work, I work all day, get off work, and then I have to drive back to Avondale Estates because he had a rehearsal after school that doesn't end until seven. So I get to Avondale Estates between six and 6.15, then I have to wait there for about 15 minutes or if rehearsal runs over 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes. Then he gets in the car and then we drive from Avondale Estates back to Lithonia. Anybody tired yet? 
All right, so then we get to Latonia. Guess what? It's dinner time. Somebody got to cook something. And since I'm the mama, he's looking at me. So then we cooking, and then we eat, and then somebody's got to clean up the kitchen. We clean up the kitchen, we do all of that. Then it's like, okay, you did your homework, everything's good, all right, good, good, good. Let's go, let's go, let's go, got to go to bed. Wait, what? You need me to sign a permission slip? You need how much money? They only want cash. I got to go to the ATM? They don't have the cash app? I, gotta, I can't write a check? No, they won't cash? Okay, I got to I gotta go to the bank and get a money order? What? Okay, so we got to fill out all these forms, do all of this. Now it's 11, maybe 11.30, sometimes midnight. We're in the bed. That's one day in the life of Alfie and Hunter James. Now we mix in some other stuff, and I might have to take somebody here, pick up somebody and take them there, or I might have a meeting at the church or something like this. And so things get on. I'm trying to get to the point that I'm busy. So if you texted me and I haven't texted you back, I apologize. I was busy. But this is what I'm getting at. In all of my busyness, y'all heard how many times I was in the car do you know how many times I arrive at my destination and I don't say thank you? Now, I ride on 20, mostly. Some of you are on 75, 85, 400, 675, 285, 985, whatever, 316. Lord have mercy. I pray for y'all on 316 all the time because it's always something going on on 316. But look at this. Do y'all notice that sign that talks about the Georgia Highway fatalities? You know, in January, it starts at zero. The last time I looked at it, it was like 1,600. And you mean to tell me that me and my good Christian self, as much as I'm in and out of the car, I can't stop and tell God, thank you, that I made it from point A to point B? I'm sounding more like the nine. I'm not sounding like the one. And if you were honest with yourself, you don't do it either. So we're busy. We're too busy to thank God. What about the times when we're just excited to get home? Like I said, I already gave the example of Ray. Y'all know Ray be burning rubber trying to get home to see BJ. Just excited to see his loved ones. Maybe you travel for work and you're out of, the, out of town, sometimes out of the country a lot. And when you get back in the country, you just want to see your family. And all the times we don't thank God that we were able to have a safe takeoff and a safe flight and then a safe landing. And then I got in an Uber with a stranger. I used to be able to, they used to teach me to don't get in a car with strangers and don't let nobody come to your house. Now I go on the internet and I call a stranger to come to my house to pick me up so I can get in the car with him and he can take me. And now he know I'm not at home. So he can go back and rob my house if he want to. And so I don't even stop to thank God that he kept my belongings and that he kept my life. See, we sounded more like the nine now though. All right, well, man, you know, sometimes, sometimes we're just ready to get on with life. I'm healed now. I got my deliverance. I got my blessing. I got my blessing. Oh, girl, let me tell you. Did I tell you about what God did for me? We want to run and tell everybody else. But we didn't turn around and say, thank you, God. See, we sound like the nine. This is the thing that got me. Maybe I'm grateful in my heart. Maybe you're grateful in your heart. And you just figure that. God should know I'm thankful. He knows everything. He ought to know how I feel about him. Well, he don't work like that. He just don't work like that. Have we become more like the nine lepers? And we don't want to tell God, thank you. One of the first signs of rejecting God is failing to thank him. But I got some good news. There's a remedy. We can fix it. Let's look at Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. I'm reading this one from the English Standard Version. You can put up whichever version you have. It'll read pretty close to the same. It says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. If you got your paper Bible, underline it, circle it, highlight it or something. If you can do it in your app, do the same. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There's that word again. Do, do the same thing that you did for thankful. Do that for thankfulness. Then verse 17, and whatever you do 
in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we saw that we got thankful, we got thankfulness, and then we got giving thanks. Thankful in verse 15, thankfulness in verse 16, and in verse 17, we got giving thanks. Now, they repeated that for a reason. We have to be told over and over and over and over again to give thanks because that's something that God requires. So if we're told that, this is a lesson that we need to get. You and I need to understand that we have to give thanks to God. We have to. So this is how we're going to do it. Number one, we're going to purpose. Number one is purpose. We have to purpose in our hearts to give thanks to God. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines purpose as something set up as an object or end to be attained. It's like a goal. Other words that are used for purpose were determination, resolution, and intention. So when I saw that word determination, the thing that came to me was you got to just make up your mind to be thankful. I'm just determined this is what it's going to be like. This is how I'm going to live my life. This word resolution, there were two very distinct definitions for resolution. The first one is an official decision that is made after a group of organi or organization has voted. The second one is a promise to yourself to do or to not do something. Now, resolution is way stronger than the way we look at it because, you know, 2019 is coming and some of us are already getting our list of New Year's resolutions that probably won't make it out of January, right? So we're going to forget that, that be part of that, that promise to ourselves, because we break promises to ourselves all the time. Let's look back at that A part of that definition. An official decision that is made after a group or an organization has voted. So this is what I need you to do. I need you to get me, myself, and I together and go ahead and vote on that thing. Go ahead and make a decision. Now, for the super spiritual that don't believe in me, myself, and I, I need you to get spirit, soul, and body together. And y'all go ahead and vote on that thing and make a decision and go ahead and put it into effect. Put it into effect now. You got to do this. It's a resolution. It's not going to be changed. We voted on this thing, and this is what we're going to do. The last word that was the definition for purpose is intention. That's a thing intended, an aim or a plan, a determination to act in a certain way. So when I say purpose, the thing that we have to do is make thanksgiving an act of our will. Well, let me talk to this side. I got to make thanksgiving an act of my will. Because, you know, we'll talk about a lot of stuff that we will and we won't do. But when I really make it an act of my will, I'm making an act choice that this is how it's going to be. I'm making an active choice today after going through this study. I got to be more thankful. I can't just be living life and going on and doing my own thing and not thanking God for his daily blessings because I don't want my mind to be foolish, dark, or confused, okay? So let's look at Psalm 7, verse 17. I'm going to run through a bunch of these Psalms if y'all can just jot them down. This is Psalm 7, verse 17. It says, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. See, this is what you got to do when you're making your purpose. You got to start making these I will statements. So some of y'all might have to print this off and write it down and do something. Put a post-it note. Put it on your sun visor. Put it on the bathroom mirror. Put it on the refrigerator. You know you're always in there if you're like me. You're always standing in there looking. If, if nothing else changed, you're going to look in there anyway, right? So you put it somewhere where you can see it. Psalm 717. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Then I turn to Psalm 9 verses 1 and 2. Again, that's Psalm 9 verses 1 and 2. And it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I'm not coming to the Lord half-hearted anymore. I'm not coming like, oh, well, thank you, God. I just, you know, you, you, you good. We good? We good. I said thank you. No, I'm not coming to him with old cavalier attitude. No, I'm bringing all the sincerity of my heart. I'm bringing it together, my whole heart. And I'm like, God, I'm going to give you thanks. 
thanks because you're worth it. I will recount of all your wonderful deeds. See, that's when I can start thanking him specifically, not generally, but when I start recounting all his wonderful deeds. When I go back to 1994 and I was in that car wreck that was intended to take me out and he let me walk away pretty much unscathed. I had a couple of cuts and bruises, but no broken bones. God, I thank you because I'm recounting your wonderful deeds. God, when, 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 when different stuff has hit my life and I had an opportunity to turn from you because I didn't understand quite why something like this could happen to me. When I came through that abusive relationship, un, oh God, with my right mind and you didn't let him do anything that would cause me any permanent physical damage. God, I thank you. See, I start to recount specific things that he has done and I just say, you know what, it, it, it starts to bubble up and it starts to overflow. I love it when Pastor D, she'll say, don't start me to thanking him because you have to be responsible for your own thanksgiving. I can't thank God for you. I cannot. I cannot. I'm glad for what God did for this one right here for Joy when he brought her through breast cancer. But I can thank him for saving my friend, but can't nobody thank him like she can for saving her life. And there's others of you who've been through some things. You start recounting what God has done for you and you begin to give him thanks as an act of your will. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. Sometimes you just got to make a determination. God, because you've been so good to me and because I'm so thankful to you, I can't help but be glad. I know stuff is going on. I know it's gray and gloomy and dreary. I know some stuff has hit my life, but you know what? I can still be glad in you. I can still be glad. Then it says, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. You just start walking through that thing. Start walking through what God has told us to do and make it an act of your will to thank him. Psalm 35, verse 18. This is one of my good ones right here. This one is specific to those of you who are afraid of open worship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're coming down your street too says, I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. See, when I purpose in my heart to be thankful, it doesn't matter who's around. It could be a crowd of 15, it could be a crowd of 1,500, 15,000, or 15 million. I don't care. I will thank you in the great congregation. Because I purpose in my heart to be thankful, so I just will. I don't care if they sing in my song. I just will. I don't care if they off key. I just will. Then Psalm 69 verse 30. Some of y'all going to like this. I will praise the name of God with a song. So you can sing your own song to the Lord. Now if you know you can't carry a tune in a bucket, don't get the microphone and sing your song, but you still sing your song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. When's the last time you magnified him with thanksgiving? Where you just thanked him so much that he got larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And then I started thanking him some more. He just got larger and larger and larger. Then that thing that was getting me down just got smaller and smaller and smaller because I began to magnify him with my thanksgiving. I will magnify him with thanksgiving so not only do i have the purpose in my heart because you know a lot of times we can purpose to do something we have a plan how many people got a plan of anything i got a plan i got an exit plan for my job right now i don't know when i'm leaving but i got a plan you understand you got a plan but planning it's only a portion of it. You got to practice. You got to put that thing in motion. So that's your second point is practice. Do y'all understand that to excel at anything requires practice? Serena Williams did not become the greatest of all time because she picked up the racket one time and decided she wanted to be great at tennis. Y'all remember when they were 10, 12-year-old little girls with them beads and them braids? 
and they were out there. And do you know they didn't just practice on the court? You can look at her. She practiced in the gym because my backhand can't get that strong if I'm not strong. I got to develop that muscle. I got to do something. She practiced. Steph Curry didn't just come out the womb hitting threes. He might have some natural ability. He might have some natural talent. But to be able to hit it from any point on the art, he had to practice. Mm -hmm. See, y'all didn't know I knew about sports. Mm -hmm. Drew Brees. For all y'all Falcons fans, I'm, miss I'm meddling. My mama here with me. I got another Saints fan. I ain't scared of y'all. <laughs> Drew Brees didn't break the passing record by throwing the ball one time. You have to practice to be that accurate. You have to practice. He had to keep on practice. He had to work that arm when that arm didn't feel like being worked. Look at the great orators of our time. Dr. Martin Luther King. Do you know that there's a little church that he practiced that I have a dream speech in before he went and presented it in Washington? Do you think Barack Obama just came out with these great speeches and being able to move crowds just because of his gift? No, he had to practice. He had to practice. We're going somewhere with this because I want y'all to get it. Musicians, Corey, how many hours do you practice a week? Look at that, he can't even count. He like, I, I, it's a bunch, right? Right, what about you, Trey? You just, you just don't, you don't just get the music and look at it one time and then just come in here on Sunday. They better get with me. They better do what I'm doing. Y'all ain't never been over there on Porter Road. Thad practiced so much, he got a hammer B3 in his living room. I ain't lying. He got one. Great performers. You think Beyonce just get out there and just tell her dancers, follow me? No, they have to practice. What am I getting at? You're going to have to practice giving thanks. You can't just have a plan. You got to put that thing in motion. You're going to have to practice. I'm going to have to practice. When was the last time you thanked God for air? Now, I know y'all youngsters, y'all can contend with this, but in my day, there were nine planets in the solar system. And the only one that was conducive for life was this one that we live on called Earth. When's the last time you thank God for making the Earth conducive for your life and my life? We have everything that we need in order to live on this planet. When's the last time you thanked him for? See, back in the day, even in that Israelite church I grew up in, you would hear the saints say stuff like this. I thank God for waking me up this morning, for being clothed, and in my right mind, uh huh, for the use and the activity of my limbs, uh huh, for a reasonable portion of my health and strength, for the blood running warm in my veins. Come on, and I know some of y'all want to go to the, the bed, what my some kind of cooling board, and my sheet, what my winding sheet. We didn't get that far, we didn't get that. That was a little deep for me. But still, when's the last time you sincerely thank God, not just saying it out of road or out of tradition, when was the last time you seriously thank God for the use and the activity of your limbs? You pass by people with disabilities every day, and you don't stop to say, God, I thank you. That could have been me, but by your grace, God, I thank you. I told y'all a couple of weeks ago that my cousin had, a, uh, had to have an emergency surgery because she had three discs in her neck that were so badly degenerated they had to put in donor bone and she's now got a titanium plate and everything. And so she's going through occupational therapy and physical therapy and we have the wonderful privilege of hosting her in our home while she's recovering. And I wanna talk about that use and the activity of our limbs because when she came out of surgery, her left arm wasn't doing right. She tried to move it, and it just flopped. 
since she's been at the house, we saw her gain some control over her fingers. Then next thing we know, her wrist started getting in control. Then can, she can start bending it at the elbow. And if she lean back a little bit, she can raise it up like this. It might be a little wobbly, but she can raise it up. Can I tell you, I thank God for the use and the activity of limbs. We want to complain because we got a little cold. That's still a reasonable portion of health and strength. You're not laying on life support somewhere. You got a little cold. God, I thank you. I thank you. I don't have to thank you that I have a cold. I just still thank you that I'm here to know that I got one. So we got to practice thanking him. So guess what? I'm a good coach. I'm like, you know, Mr. Williams, I'm not going to let y'all leave here without practicing. So if you're able, I want you to stand. You don't have to stand back there, P.F., I got you. I know you're standing up on the inside. <laughs> so we're going to walk through some scriptures, and then you're going to have an opportunity to practice what we're talking about. First, we're going to go to Psalm 106.1. It says, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Can you give thanks to the Lord, for he is good? Just for his goodness. And I understand that clapping your hands is good, but the last time I checked, thank you has to come up out of your mouth. It's got to start in your heart, and then it's got to move on up your throat, and it's got to come out of your mouth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 105 and 1 says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among, among the people. Can you call on his name this morning? Go ahead and give him thanks and start making known his deeds among the people. It's all right to testify to somebody. Tell them how good God has been to you. Go ahead and thank him for deliverance. Go ahead and thank him for healing. Go ahead and thank him for your wholeness. Go ahead and thank him that you're in your right mind. Go ahead and thank him. We have to give him thanks. This is our practice because what you do in here today is going to determine what you do at your house tomorrow and in the coming days. So all oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Psalm 118 verses 1 through 4 says, all oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good because his mercy endures forever. The Bible says let Israel now say, but I say let new covenant now say that his mercy endures forever. God, we thank you for your enduring mercy. We thank you that you gave us mercy when we didn't deserve it. When we deserve judgment, you gave mercy. So the house of new covenant, God, we say thank you. Then it says, let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. That's all the priests, the ministers, the minstrels, the singers, and all of them. Come on and say that his mercy endures forever. Then it says, and let them now that fear the Lord. Any of you that fear the Lord, go ahead and say that his mercy endures forever. God, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for it, oh God. We thank you for it. You may have your seats if you're able. See, we have to get a little practice in. We have to get a little practice in. See, some of us had said thank you in so long, it seems kind of foreign. But we got to get our practice in because our purpose now in my heart to be thankful. We look at Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. This is very familiar. What does it say? Enter into his gates with what? With thanksgiving. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. It says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So what does that say to me? See, the gates mark the perimeter of the property. When they came into the tabernacle, into the temple, they had a gate up. So when they got to the gate, they had to start thanking God. So what does that mean for you and I here at New 
new covenant. It means when you come onto the property at 1760, as soon as you make that right turn in or that left turn in, depending on which way you're coming, as soon as you hit the property, you should start singing thanksgiving unto the Lord. You got to enter to the gates with thanksgiving. I shouldn't have to poke and prod. We shouldn't have to coerce you into thanking God because this is what the word says. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Then you come into the court with praise because once I start thanking him, I can't help but praise him because I just like, God, you're so good. You're so awesome. You're so magnificent. I start praising him. Where's the courts? As soon as you hit that door, you're in the court of the Lord. You begin to praise him and you thank him and you praise him and you thank him and you praise him. But guess what? It's just not relegated to this place. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the living God? So every time I look in the mirror, I'm entering to the gate and I can begin to say, God, thank you. Every time I turn around, I'm looking around and I say, thank you, God. And then I begin to go into the courts. I draw a little closer to him because my thanksgiving gets my foot in the door. Then I can draw a little closer and I start praising him, and then I can become more intimate with him, and I just begin to express how wonderful he is to me. So this is how we practice. It's our lives as Christians, we should be filled with thanksgiving. We should be filled with thankfulness. There shouldn't be complaining in our lips. Oh, we complain all the time. No, we got to practice everything that you've complained about this week. Your practice is to stop complaining and start thanking. So not only must we purpose and practice, we got to persist. Because guess what? The devil don't care that you purpose and practice. Don't you know that life is going to hand you some circumstances that are going to be unpleasant? And you're going to look around and say, this is a thankless situation. But the word of God says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. Look at that. My preacher's already quoting it because she knows she got that in her, she got that one down. In everything, in everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I believe that hit everybody. The ESV, in case you know, in everything, give thanks. In case that wasn't clear, the ESV says, give thanks in all circumstances. Again, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Notice, it didn't say give thanks for the circumstance. It said give thanks in the circumstance. Why is there a distinction? What's the difference, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. The difference is, if I'm in the circumstance, he's in it too. That's why I can give him thanks. I'm going to say it again because somebody missed that. If I'm in the circumstance, he's in it too. How do I know that? Well, Hebrews 13 and 5 the B portion says, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, there was no circumstances. No, there was no uh, caveats on that. If he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that's exactly what he meant. So if I'm in a desperate situation, guess what? He's in it with me. And then I can turn around and say, God, I thank you for your presence in my life. God, I thank you that you're right here with me and you're going to pull me up out of this situation. God, I thank you. And then you can just fill in the blank from there. Another verse, in case Hebrews wasn't your flavor, let's go to Matthew 28, 20. This is when Jesus was given a great commission. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. In one translation, say, until the end of the world. Sometimes we get in situations and it seems like our whole world is coming to an end. God, how could you let this happen to me? My life is in shambles. It's shattered. My world is ending. But then I can take courage because he says, lo, I am with you you always, even to the end of the world. So now I don't have to sit there and wallow in my sorrow. I can pick myself up and say, God, I thank you that 
that you haven't left me. And if this world is, God, you're great enough that you can give me a whole new world. So, God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Knowing that he's with me gives me a reason to be thankful. Knowing that he's with me gives me a right to be thankful. So it doesn't matter the situation. Some of us are in some situation. It don't matter what it is. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter the diagnosis. Some of us have gotten some diagnoses that we didn't like and that we thought that God had left us. But he says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. It doesn't matter the trouble. Some of us have trouble on every side, but it doesn't matter. I can still give God thanks in the trouble. Some of us have some struggles, and we like to tell people, well, you know, the struggle is real. The struggle may be real, but my God is real, and he's with me in the struggle. I thank you, God. Then some of us may have some tragedies. It doesn't matter what the tragedy is. Our God is still with us in tragedy. Sometimes we have good times. He's with us in the good times. Sometimes we have bad times. He is with us in the bad times. And so because of all of this, I got to persist in giving him thanks because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. So if you and I, if you and I want to develop a thankful heart and a thankful lifestyle, we got a first purpose to be thankful. Then we have to practice thanksgiving. And then we have to persist in thanking God in every situation. Can you give the Lord praise? Come and experience transforming worship at New Covenant Christian Ministries. We have two locations. Our West Campus is located at 1760 Phillips Road, Lithonia, Georgia. Our East Campus is located at 14147 Highway 278, Covington, Georgia. For more information, please visit our website at www.newcov.org.